thank you for having me today. Again, my name is Julie Harding. Um, I am on faculty with the infectious disease group, so I have kind of an interesting role as a pharmacist. Um, you know, rather than down in the pharmacy dispensing medications, I round with the infectious disease team, um, and I'm dedicated 100% to the bone and joint infection team. Um, there is a clinical infectious disease pharmacist on Dr. Arnold's team as well. Uh, her name is Lynn Nelson Wardlow. She might be popping in at some point today. Um, so, in general, they asked me to talk about antibiotics for 45 minutes, and honestly, I could talk about antibiotics for days. So I thought, rather than just try to start with a drug class and then get cut off in 45 minutes, I thought what would be more beneficial is just review some important properties of antibiotics, and then we'll get into specific antibiotic drug classes in the subsequent lectures. So one of the most important concepts when I'm, I mean, as a pharmacist, I'm trying to select an antibiotic regimen um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to treat an infection is I have to think about several different factors, right? Um, so we've got one factor on the left-hand side with the bacteria matching up with the drug. So obviously my antibiotic needs to be active against that particular pathogen. Um, I might have resistance issues in my particular hospital, and today I'm going to review with you where to find some of our local resistance um, issues um, on the antibiogram so that you can kind of get an idea of some areas of resistance that we have in the hospital. Uh, another thing that I need to think about um, is not just matching up the bug and the drug, but you have to think about the patient as well, right? Um, you know, let's say that I have a patient with a particular allergy. Uh, maybe they have renal dysfunction, and this particular antibiotic causes renal, function, renal dysfunction. Um, or maybe I need to think about the patient in terms of this particular type of infection is at a site that maybe not all antibiotics get to. A good example would be, let's say that we have a patient with a urinary tract infection, and um, we're looking for an antibiotic to treat that urinary tract infection. Well, there are certain antibiotics that just don't really get to the urine. Um, moxifloxacin doesn't get there. Clindamycin doesn't get there. Um, another consideration when we're thinking about the host is not only making sure that the antibiotic gets to the site of infection, but when it's at that site of infection, is it potentially inactivated? Um, I'm sure if you've been on a critical care rotation working on a patient that um, potentially has an MRSA pneumonia or maybe even a diagnosed MRSA pneumonia, daptomycin is one of those um, antibiotics that when it reaches the surfactant in the lung, the surfactant binds that antibiotic and renders it inactive. So I have to not only match up the bug and the drug, but I have to make sure that the drug reaches the site of infection, that that site of infection is... Um, uh, you know, there aren't toxicities at that site of infection, and so I'm, I have to think about my patient, so I'm constantly juggling all of these things when I'm trying to come up with a regimen. Um, I think I, I tried to simplify the presentation by coming up with three main themes. Uh, the first theme is that your drug has to reach the site of infection, right? I mean, if you're going to give someone an antibiotic and all antibiotics cause toxicities, let's make sure that our antibiotic at least gets there. Uh, the next theme is going to be, once the antibiotic gets to that site of infection, it better be active against the bug. So we're going to review uh, mechanisms of action and some target sites for some of our antimicrobials. And the third theme is that let's say you get your drug to the site of infection, and let's say that that drug is effective at an active target site. Well, what if the antibiotic doesn't kill very well? Sometimes we look for antibiotics that are very potent in their killing, and sometimes an antibiotic that just slowly kills is okay. Um, and that is definitely something that we think about when we're giving regimens as well. So related to our first theme, which is it must reach the site of infection, um, as pharmacists we all learn the kind of basic properties of what happens to a drug when it enters our body, right? Um, you know, if we take a drug through the IV route, we know that almost 100% of that drug um, is definitely going to get into the circulation. But if the drug is administered through any other route... You have the first the Okay. Um, if the drug is administered through any other route, you have to think about the different absorption through that other route, right? Um, so getting into our very first slide, which is absorption, um, we know that IV is 100% absorbed, but through some of these other routes, it's very highly variable. Um, 
there's, you know, we can definitely get antibiotics through the oral route, rectal route, through G-tubes, through NG-tubes. Um, we really don't give antibiotics commonly through the intramuscular route. But one of the big things that we learn as pharmacists, and it often comes up on rounds, is when we can potentially switch an antibiotic from the IV route to the PO route. Um, so there are some antibiotics that have very good absorption when they're administered orally and others that don't. Um, some good, excellent oral bioavailability drugs are going to be fluoroquinolones. Uh, clindamycin is great. Metronidazole is great. Uh, we've also got linazolid, some of the tetracyclines. Um, and Bactrim's not so bad. It's like 80 to 85 percent orally bioavailable. So, you know, if I have a patient with a severe infection, I want to make sure that I choose a route that's going to maximize the drug concentration that can potentially reach the site of infection. Um, maybe in a more mild infection, you could pick an oral antibiotic that has maybe not so good oral bioavailability, but when you really need high concentrations, this concept of oral bioavailability is very important. It's good to know how much um, is, is getting absorbed. We can also sometimes bypass systemic circulation altogether by doing a direct installation um, of antibiotic at different sites of infection. So we can inhale antibiotics. I mean, you can do that with aminoglycosides and cephalosporins. Um, also with aztreonam, that's possible. And we can also do intraperitoneal antibiotics, intrathecal antibiotics, and antifungals. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can get the antibiotic into the, into the body in the first place. Uh, the next important property is distribution, right? So this is extremely important in ID. Um, understanding where your antibiotic distributes within the body. Um, if your antibiotic doesn't reach the site of infection, then you've got the wrong antibiotic. And so this is just a very, very important property to understand. Uh, a good example would be uh, tetracyclines. So tetracyclines have very, very high volumes of distribution. They distribute very well into tissues, so much so that there's really not a lot left in the bloodstream to treat a bloodstream infection. It's a really important very important thing to know about that drug. Um, you know, other factors that I've listed here may be lipid solubility, um, also the amount of fluid. So aminoglycosides like to stay in fluid. They're very hydrophilic. In areas where there's a lot of fluid, potentially in ascites or the bloodstream or pleural fluid, aminoglycosides are going to have penetration. But into areas of fat, not so much. Um, also, speaking about tissue penetration, uh, we could talk about azithromycin and potentially a Z-pack or a tripack for a respiratory infection. Um, azithromycin, as well as the rest of the macrolides, have such fantastic tissue penetration that they go straight into the tissues and they stay there for days. You know, that's one reason why we can give a tripack and you still have azithromycin in the lung or in the respiratory tract for um, potentially up to a week. Another consideration is thinking of, you know, I, I told you the story of tetracyclines and how they don't have good penetration into the bloodstream. Um, maybe another potential thing to talk about is when we have a very difficult type of infection like a meningitis, and you have to think about whether or not your antibiotic crosses into the CSF. Um, good example would be a lot of our, um, some of our beta-lactams, for example, cefazolin, which is a first-generation cephalosporin, and even zosin don't cross well into across the blood-brain barrier at all. Um, they're really not to be used for a meningitis. And that's really all I wanted to say on this slide. Uh, the third property is metabolism. Um, with our antimicrobial classes, there are lots of drug interactions, primarily those within the liver. Um, just, you know, looking at just a few of our antibiotic or antifungal drug classes, I listed some here. Uh, we've got macrolides, rifamycins, um, the sulfa drugs, azol antifungals, and these agents are either metabolized by the liver or they actually rev up or rev down the liver liver through its inhibition or induction. Um, I wanted to show you briefly where you can have some tools that are available to you so you can actually look up some of those interactions. Um, so in NetAccess we have one um, system called clinical pharmacology and it's available through your links and you can type up any drug for example let's say I wanted to look up rifampin 
and you'll go over here to Rayfampin and it has all of these different options at the top so you can look up um, you know any of your drug interactions here we've got side effects over here and then um, there also is a pharmacist that's dedicated to each of the internal medicine teams as well as infectious disease psych critical care we are totally willing to help um, and would love to help you out with any of your drug interactions at any time um, in the emergency room, they have a pharmacist until 10 p.m., and then you could always call the inpatient pharmacy for assistance. <clears throat> the last important property is elimination. Um, so, you know, after the drug is in the body, it's distributed in the body, it's been metabolized, it's got to leave the body, right? Um, and some antibiotics um, are eliminated through the renal route and others are eliminated through other routes. Um, through the renal route, specifically with glomerular filtration, uh, two important antibiotic drug classes that need renal dosing considerations are going to be vancomycin and aminoglycosides. And we do see a significant um, change in how those antibiotics tend to accumulate in the body as the glomerular filtration rate decreases. Um, so pharmacy can help dose those. Um, we can help uh, with, particularly with vancomycin, making sure that your dose is within the appropriate trough range. And then with aminoglycosides, we can help make sure that your um, antibiotic is in the appropriate trough or peak range. There are also some antibiotics, such as the penicillins, that are eliminated through tubular secretion. Um, of course, dialysis is its whole other dynamic in terms of which antibiotics might be removed through dialysis. And then I listed on the bottom some antibiotics that are actually eliminated through other routes. Okay, so now that we've reviewed that the antibiotic has to get to the site of infection. Um, our next big thing was making sure that once the antibiotic gets to the site of infection, there's a target that it's effective against. <laughs> Is that okay? Alan, we can hear you. We can hear you. Did it just lose the sound? No, he just came on. He just connected. Okay. I just got it, so I had to turn the signal back on and try to do it four times. It now is working, so I have video. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. Alan, we can hear you. Hey, Alan. Thank you for coming to my presentation, and we can totally hear you. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. Oh, yeah, not a problem. All right, so second theme is making sure that once the antibiotic gets to the site of infection that there's a target that it's active against. So I thought this would be a helpful slide to review some of our important antibacterial targets and mechanisms of action. Um, antibiotics work against the cell wall, and I've listed a few here for you. The beta-lactams, which bind to penicillin binding proteins. Vancomycin, which binds to the termini of peptidoglycan, so that peptidoglycan can't make its cell wall. It binds to the ends of it, so you can't do cross-linking. Uh, we've got daptomycin, which actually pokes holes through the cell membrane and causes leakage of uh, membrane channels um, and lysis, so it's a very potent antibiotic. Uh, televancin, which is kind of a mashup of vancomycin and daptomycin, it does both mechanisms of action. And the azoles also work by binding to ergosterol in the fungal cell wall. We've also got some agents that work inside of the bacterial cell, um, and those primarily work through interaction with either a ribosome or through DNA gyrase or topoisomerase. And I've listed a, a few here for you. So we have, of the ribosomal agents, tetracyclines, macrolides, clindamycin, chloramphenicol, and synersid. And by binding to the ribosome, they're going to shut down that factory of protein synthesis. Um, fluoroquinolones bind to DNA gyrase and topoisomerase. Uh, we also have the rifamycins binding to RNA polymerase. And linazolid is also another one of our ribosomal agents. Sorry about that. wonder if that's Alan calling, right? Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. We've got another agent, which is basically like a detergent. You know, let's just think if you put a detergent in a, 
um, a bottle full of um, fat and shake it up. It basically kind of dissolves the fat. And that's what the polymyxins do. So they basically dissolve the cell wall. And then we also have metronidazole working to inhibit free radical formation. Well, you know, it would be perfect if all of these mechanisms of action were always effective and you could always have activity at those mechanisms of action. Um, and here's a slide here that kind of reviews those mechanisms of action, but unfortunately we do have resistance problems, right? Um, so this slide primarily um, summarizes our four main types of resistance with antimicrobials. The first is <clears throat> through some sort of enzymatic inactivation of either the target site or the antimicrobial. All right, so a good example would be beta-lactamases. Uh, beta-lactamases actually um, bind through suicide inhibition, so a permanent covalent bond, um, and they destroy the beta-lactam ring and they inactivate beta-lactam antimicrobials. Another example is the aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. <clears throat> A second resistance mechanism is an alteration to the target site. So going back to our previous slide and looking at some of those different target sites, such as ribosomes or penicillin binding proteins or DNA gyrase or topoisomerase, I mean, if, if the bacteria were able to totally change one of those target sites altogether, then it totally gives your antibiotic no target to bind to, right? Um, I mean, one of the things that bacteria can do with fluoroquinolones is they can modify their DNA gyrase and topoisomerase so that the, so that the fluoroquinolone can't even bind to them um, and be effective anymore. <clears throat> I've lumped um, number three and number four into the last bullet here. So another way that bacteria can develop resistance is by decreasing the ability of that antibiotic to get into the cell in the first place. So it can either change porin channels, which are basically gates in the cell wall that allow substances such as antibiotics to enter into the cytoplasm, or it can create pumps that take chemicals, including antibiotics, and pump them back out of the cytoplasm and out of the cell. Those are called <coughs> efflux pumps. Um, bacteria have the ability to very, very quickly change the porin channels on their, in their cell wall. Um, <clears throat> And they actually have the ability also to very quickly change the number of efflux pumps that are circulating in the cytoplasm. So if there's a foreign substance such as an antibiotic that's developing high concentrations in the cytoplasm, it's a very quick turnaround for the bacteria to just all of a sudden put lots of efflux pumps into the cytoplasm and pump that antibiotic back out. All right, so the third theme is that we must be able to kill, right? So we've already gotten the antibiotic into the body, and we've already made sure that we have some sort of target for that antibiotic to bind to. But if the antibiotic gets to the bacteria and it doesn't really have the ability to kill it, or it doesn't kill it very well, then we're not going to have success with our regimen. So this is kind of a unique area um, that's really specific to antimicrobial therapy, um, and it really makes... Um, what I think uh, infectious disease fun from a trying to come up with a therapy sort of, uh, it, it makes it more like a puzzle to me. Um, so let's talk about some of our different considerations here. So once the drug is in the body, the body can react back to the drug, right? We could have some toxic effects from the drug. And then we also need to talk about what is the relationship between the concentration of the drug that we actually get to the site of infection and how that affects its antimicrobial activity. Some of those important properties are whether or not the antibiotic is bactericidal or static, if it's concentration or time dependent. We need to talk about what synergy really means when we're using multiple antibiotics together, and we'll also talk about the post-antibiotic effect. So let's differentiate between bacteriostatic and bactericidal. There are some antimicrobial classes that really don't have the ability to kill in the first place. They don't, when that antimicrobial 
reaches the target of the organism, it just slows it down. It, it, it disables its ability to really produce more of itself, um, but it really doesn't actually kill the organism that's already at the site of infection. And that's your option on the left, which is bacteriostatic. It inhibits growth, it inhibits replication, but if you already have a large burden of infection um, at a specific site, it's not going to eradicate the bacteria that are there quickly. It's going to take a while for the bacteria that are there to to go ahead and kind of die on their own and they won't be able to produce more bacteria but it's just not super potent. Um, some of those are our sulfa drugs and also the linazolid through their interaction with folic acid synthesis and protein synthesis. On the right hand side we actually have antibiotics that once they encounter a bacteria they kill it. They kill the bacteria that are already there at the site of infection, and if there's no more bacteria, you obviously can't have replication um, of more bacteria. Um, one would be the beta-lactams. So by binding with a beta-lactam with its penicillin binding protein, that actually causes a very cytal, a very potent killing of the bacteria, um, and it actually causes cell lysis and death. Daptomycin is another example that does that. Uh, fluoroquinolones through their inhibition um, of DNA gyrase and topoisomerase basically shut down the factory for DNA and RNA production, right? So that's going to have a pretty potent effect on, um, on the bacteria. And aminoglycosides have a very, very potent effect at their ribosome. Two important um, distinctions, we have an MIC and we have an MBC. So the MIC is the minimum drug and concentration needed to inhibit growth of more organism. So if we go back up to the top, right, those organisms that are in the bactericidal category, if we give that drug at maybe a low dose, or maybe there's just so much bacteria to try to overcome at the site of infection, that bactericidal agent in its spectrum of no killing at all, all the way up to cytal killing, there's a static component there, right? So the minimum inhibitory concentration is really just the concentration that we need to inhibit growth of more organisms. Now there's also a minimum bactericidal concentration, <laughs> and for those drugs that, and I'm gonna go back one slide, for those drugs that actually have the capability of becoming bactericidal, um, we can dose even more aggressively and we can get a concentration at which we're actually doing bactericidal killing. For some drug classes, the difference between the MIC and the MBC is very, very small, such that there's really not much of a difference in dosing between when you're inhibiting and when you're killing in a bactericidal manner. For others, there's a very large difference. Um, they'll study that in the laboratory. It's called tolerance when there's a very large difference. Um, we do a test here on the Infectious Disease Service, and it's not a common test that we'll do, um, but if we want to get an idea of whether or not our antibiotic is killing in our particular patient for the organism that's infecting our patient, if we want to know if our antibiotic is killing in a bactericidal manner, there's a test that we can do where we obtain a sample of the patient's serum and we send that organism to the laboratory and they'll actually perform in a serial dilution manner um, a test that tells us what is the minimum inhibitory concentration and what is the minimum bactericidal concentration so that we can get an idea of how that antibiotic is killing in our own patient. All right, um, now stepping aside from bactericidal and bacteriostatic, uh, let's talk about different ways that antibiotics kill. Um, so some kill at very high concentrations, and there are other antibiotics that kill just by being there. They just need to hang out. You don't really need to have a super high concentration of the antibiotic, it just needs to be there for a certain amount of time. So looking at the graph, or looking at the... Um, at the chart that we have here, um, where you've got time on the x-axis and you have drug concentration on the y-axis, um, the very first category, which is concentration dependent, is going to be that peak to MIC. And I don't have a pointer. Oh, let me close this. I don't have a pointer, so I'm just going to use this, I guess. So this peak to MIC, so making sure that our peak concentration is well above 
um, potentially even 10 to 20 times above the MIC, is how these antibiotics kill best. Um, we have in the next slides, we'll actually talk about which antimicrobial classes kill at a concentration or time-dependent manner. Um, but talking about time-dependent, right here, looking at this specific time, we just need to have the antibiotic just a time above the MIC. It doesn't need to be at a super high concentration. It just needs to be there. And I hope this works. I oh, Hold on. How do I... I put a little thing in here, and so it's supposed to have another little curve that pops up here, and I don't know how to get it. Maybe let me see if I can get it. I don't know where it went. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll I'll pretend like I'm drawing it on here. Thank you. So um, for an antibiotic that needs time-dependent killing, you could potentially give an antibiotic here at time zero and just have that antibiotic stay in the system continuously at a concentration above the MIC, and that's when you have the best killing. There's a third property, which is area under the curve, and it's kind of a mashup of um, peak-dependent killing or concentration-dependent killing and time-dependent killing. Looking at some examples of concentration-dependent killing, we have three different drug classes here on this particular slide. On the left, we have tobramycin, which is an aminoglycoside, and it is a very potent concentration-dependent drug. We have ciprofloxacin, which also has a concentration-dependent capability. And on the right, we have beta-lactams, which are time-dependent. And what I'd like for you to look at here is um, for each of these different drug classes, you'll know that there's a curve at the very top, which is a black curve, and that's our control. And then as, um, as we follow the colors kind of down, you have blue and then a maroon color and then a yellow color and then a, what is that, purple and then a green color. And each of those different lines are the amount of killing that occurs when you double the dose, right? So let's look at the blue line. So let's say that we have um, a dose that is around a fourth of the MIC. You really don't see a difference between the different drug classes. But as we start going four times the MIC, 16 times the MIC, and 64 times the MIC, with the green, purple, and yellow curves, you see a significant increase in killing with our concentration-dependent drugs, such as tobramycin and ciprofloxacin. And as you increase the doses with ticarcillin, you just don't see any benefit. There's just no additional killing with that drug. Um, so just wanted to reiterate here that our concentration-dependent drug classes are aminoglycosides, daptomycin, and fluoroquinolones. Concentration-dependent drugs also have an added bonus in that they often cause a post-antibiotic effect. And what this really means is once that huge, huge peak dose, you've given a huge whopping dose to your patient, um, that huge dose causes such a significant injury to the bacteria that it actually takes them longer to recover. And that's essentially kind of how to think of a post-antibiotic effect. Um, aminoglycosides, um, let's see, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, switching away from post-antibiotic effect, I wanted to talk about how we can manipulate this concentration-dependent dosing, right? So um, the, the graph here shows you different ways that we can dose aminoglycosides, which we know are a concentration-dependent drug. Um, in the green curve, where you have intermittent dosing or conventional dosing of an aminoglycoside, and that would be kind of a, you know, uh, every eight hour, every 12 hour aminoglycoside dosing sort of throughout the day where we monitor peaks and troughs. Um, that dosing, you can see it really doesn't obtain a very large peak. It kind of looks more like a time dependent way of dosing that drug. Um, what we do here is a once daily or extended interval dosing of the aminoglycoside where instead of taking the daily dose and dividing it into several doses a day, we give one huge dose and then we check for levels. Where did my, 
here it is. We check for levels right around here to see where the drug is to give us an idea of what the concentration of the drug is. Um, and we know that that huge, huge dose has such a substantial effect on killing the organism um, that you can even have a significant amount of drug-free time um, where that where that organism is so injured, you don't really have to worry about regrowth. Um, this is a way to not only take advantage of our concentration-dependent property of the drug and have maximal killing with the drug, um, but it's also a way to kind of preserve kidney function, right? Um, so if aminoglycosides cause their nephrotoxicity by accumulating in the renal tubules, by dosing through the once daily dosing, which is the curve in red, we actually give those kidneys a significant break, kind of a six hour break from the aminoglycoside to let the compartment in the tubules empty before we hit them with a strong dose again. Looking at time dependent killing, again, this is a, a, a property of the um, how the, the drugs are killing, um, the, the, sorry, property of how the drugs are killing the organism. We really just need to have the presence of that drug at a concentration that's a little bit above the MIC for a significant amount of period, right? Um, so here's a, you know, in red, we've got the time above the MIC, and so we have a, this time on the x-axis. Um, different beta-lactams, because they're time dependent, have different requirements. Um, such that penicillins, for example, need 50% of the dosing interval above the MIC. Carbapenems and cephalosporins need a little bit less. Um, but it really doesn't matter what our peak, peak is here. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is an opportunity for creative dosing strategies, and I wanted to talk about a few that um, they are implementing here at University Hospital. Um, so one is with continuous infusions, right? So a continuous infusion is sort of this idea of we're giving the drug and we're keeping it at a concentration that just stays above the MIC for an entire 24-hour period, right? I mean, what a way to maximize the time above MIC property. Um, some examples are penicillin, nafcillin, and cefazolin, but we can't do it with all beta-lactams. Um, some of the barriers have to do with stability at room temperature. For example, IV ampicillin and IV unison are only staple at room temperature for six hours, so we can't make a 24-hour bag. Um, same thing with carbapenems. They're only stable at room temperature for a certain number of hours, and so we really can't create this um, ideal way of dosing. Um, another strategy is a prolonged infusion. So instead of administering your antibiotic over 30 minutes, we could administer it over a longer amount of time. And that's what we've implemented here with Zosin. So instead of giving Zosin 3.375, running it in over 30 minutes and doing that every six hours, we actually do 3.375, run it over four hours, and give it every eight hours. Um, it's less expensive. Uh, you're um, subjecting the patient to potentially less toxicities because you're giving less total drug a day. And it has the exact same efficacy, if not better time above the MIC because that slow infusion is keeping the drug concentration above the MIC for a longer amount of time. Um, there are some indications where that's not appropriate, and so it's really not recommended in febrile neutropenia, in morbidly obese, or in CF patients, and there is a policy that's available on InfoStation to remind you of those um, specific types of infections. Another example is meropenem. Um, so where traditional dosing of meropenem is one gram every six to eight hours, um, or one gram every eight hours, we do 500 milligrams every six hours. And it's that same idea of where you're giving the drug multiple times a day, even though we're not running this one over four hours, we're just running it over 30 minutes. Um, it is a way to kind of keep that concentration above the MIC for a greater amount of time throughout the day and throughout at the dosing um, frequency. All right, so that third one was kind of a mashup. It's AUC over MIC. So it's sort of where concentration is important. It's sort of where time above the MIC is important. And we know that some antimicrobials, such as vancomycin or fluoroquinolones, macrolides, tetracyclines, all have this property. And where it leaves us as, with ph as pharmacists, um, it kind of leaves us in sort of a conundrum, because it's very difficult to figure out how to dose this, right? 
I mean, a concentration-dependent drug is easy. You give a higher dose. A time-dependent drug is easy. You give kind of more doses throughout the day at not as high doses. But it's very difficult to figure out how to um, achieve this target from a dosing standpoint. Next, I'd like to talk about the concept of antimicrobial synergy. Um, when it comes to using antibiotics together, there are actually very few examples of true synergy, which is the killing of the microbe occurs um, at a higher rate when both antibiotics are used together compared to when they're used alone. You know, so this is not talking about combination therapy for pseudomonas, right? This is not talking about using um, maybe Lebequin plus Zosin to make sure you're covering Pseudomonas in the first place. This is a different property of, of having a combination of antimicrobials that actually kill in a more potent way. And some examples are beta-lactams in combination with aminoglycosides. Um, it's one reason why we use um, Bactrim as a combination pill. And also vancomycin with aminoglycosides has a much more potent killing effect against staph. All right, so in the real world, how do I use this, right? I mean, we just talked about all these different properties of thinking about would the drug get to the site of infection, how does it even kill? I mean, that's a lot to think about on rounds. So um, some of the things that we talk about are um, some of our host characteristics, um, thinking about different <coughs> allergies, thinking about obesity, uh, renal failure, liver disease, fluid status, you know, on ID, we are trying to get to know our patient as much as possible rather than just matching up a bug and a drug. I mean, you've got to understand the dynamics in your patient in order to come up with the best antibiotic. Um, it is some, you know, using uh, allergy information is something that when you all are collecting that information in the emergency room or with a new consult, try to be as specific as possible. Um, there are numerous um, articles out there that demonstrate patients that receive second and third line antibiotics due to reported allergy have a worse outcome. So it's really important to make sure that if somebody d does have a true allergy to an antibiotic, document it. If not, let's try to maybe challenge that, right? Um, you want to try to use the drug of choice whenever possible.